If not, just give a yell. So when we talk about rare disease, it's always good to have some idea about prevalence. How many people would have Myra syndrome? Well, it's a very difficult question to answer at this point. We do have some figures we could use. First of all, we can look at control databases. So there are huge genetic control databases available like NOMAD that have sequenced over 150,000 people for their whole uh, exome or genome. And what we see is that the typical Myers syndrome mutations pop up in about three in 125,000 individuals. These were all below the age of 30 years old. So that's actually a huge number. That's almost one in, in 40,000. On the other hand, if we look at the number of individuals that are followed by people of the professional advisory board, and I think that those within the advisory board would have some idea about the total number of Myers syndrome page patients in the region they cover. And then we see that we only have about one in one million. So how can we really conceal that? So in the GNOMA database, one in 40,000 and one in a million that are actually known. Well, we've talked about Myers syndrome being a spectrum disorder. So there can be rather severe phenotypes, but it can also be rather mild phenotypes. And so what we know is actually what we already have uh, published in literature. That is basic knowledge on Myers syndrome. But of course, there is an ascertainment bias in literature. We will evidently identify those individuals first with more severe symptoms. There can be also very mild phenotypes. And there may be also some um, individuals that have no uh, clear phenotype or phenotypes of Myers syndrome. That is possible, but it remains to be investigated. When it comes to adults, it might even become more difficult. So knowledge is currently limited what we know from literature. So there are about 26 cases reported in literature on uh, adult individuals with Myers syndrome. Are there probably a lot of individuals with mild phenotypes? Are they just staying under the radar? I know that, for instance, many adults with some um, neuropsychological issues don't reach the geneticist at all. They might be not tested. They might be familial cases and then stay under the radar as quite a lot of uh, literature states that Myers syndrome is rather a sporadic disease. And it might of course be completely non-penetrant individuals having a, a, a variant causing, normally causing Myers syndrome. So I would like to tell you a bit first about the Ghent experience. So these patients all uh, consented to having their pictures uh, being shown here at the conference. So this is actually uh, the first proband, male adult proband I saw with Myers syndrome. It was actually the nephrologist who called me in his consultation. I was doing uh, on the other side of the hallway doing consultations, uh, genetic consultations. They said, well, can you just have a look? Uh, we have this patient and he's known with severe hypertension because he had a narrowing of his renal artery. And when we tried to balloon that, we saw that he had also a huge aortic, uh, hypoplastic aorta. And the anesthesiologist said that the intubation for the procedure was quite difficult. And then just based on his features, I suspected Myers syndrome. He told me he had uh, normal intelligence, which was true. He was trained as a psychologist, but he said, yes, I do recognize I have quite some autistic features. It's just not possible for me to do my job as a psychologist. So he's working more in administration now. He has a rather short stature. He has a congenital hearing loss for the low, lower range. Uh, he had cataracts uh, and he is known to have uh, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. 
He has some contractures in his fingers and rather short fingers. But then he said, well, if I have my wrist syndrome, my brother must have the same because we are like, uh, we are just similar, we are alike. And my brother also has a daughter who is also rather short. And my father was also rather short. So then I saw his brother. He had an operation for uh, a hypoplasia of the um, carotid uh, artery, so in, in, in neck vessel. He was known with severe arterial hypertension. He also had normal intelligence. He was a bioengineer. He's working for the government. And he also admits he has some autistic features. He's rather short, has cataract. He has type two diabetes mellitus. He also had some contractures of his fingers and rather short hands and fingers. So that was the second one. And you don't have to be a geneticist to see that they are quite alike. And we've identified the smart form mutation, the origin in 49616. So, and then I saw the daughter. She said, well, uh, she's relatively short at the P3 for females in Belgium. She doesn't have hypertension. She didn't have cataract. Um, she had some slight learning problems, but uh, did normal uh, school. Um, but she said, well, I have a diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. She doesn't have particularly long fingers. She does have tapering of her fingers, so they become more narrow at uh, the ends. And also in her, we identified the same familial mutation. In her brother, who was almost 30 centimeters taller, he didn't have the mutation. This was a second proband. He's a male of 52 years old. He had a bilateral extraction of his lenses at the age of five, but we couldn't find out the reason for that uh, later on when he consulted at this age. He had a rather short, short stature and a thick, stiff skin uh, with some uh, contractures also of his elbows, shoulders, and fingers. He had rather short fingers. He had a little below uh, lower range uh, average intelligence. Um, he had some autistic features and he developed a sensitive peripheral neuropathy. So initially, because we didn't know the exact reason for his lens extraction, we presumed that it was because of ectopic lenses. So we first looked at the differential diagnosis of Myers syndrome, glial Marcanzani syndrome, but all the known genes for that were normal. We then identified Myers syndrome when looking at SMAT4. Finally, we saw this uh, female in clinic now almost uh, 20 years ago. She was actually uh, referred by a fertilization uh, department uh, because of recurrent miscarriages. Uh, she also had surgery when she was one year old. We didn't know whether it was a patent arterial duct or a coarctation. Based on the scar, it's very difficult to uh, identify that, and we didn't have the files from her at that time. Um, she had a scoliosis because of vertebral defect, and she had a severe stridor uh, because of a narrowing of the trachea following surgery. Eventually, she required a tracheostomy. Uh, she had normal intelligence and she didn't report any autistic features, but never had uh, neuropsychological testing. So as you can see, she had two children equally affected with Myers syndrome, uh, and she had about six miscarriages. And these are actually her two children. Now, at this time, they're adults uh, as well. They're 16 and 18 years old. Uh, and one of these children has a tetralogy of a fellow. Um, it's known as, as one of the possible cardiac congenital defects. Eventually, you see her there with her trachea stomy because of the severe narrowing of her trachea. We also identified the origin in 49616. So that's how we got triggered about 
um, the study um, adults with Myris syndrome, we actually want to do first a good literature review. What is known? Um, problem with literature reviews is that you're always looking at a um, specific time point at the time a patient's history is being published. So there's often a lot of lacking data. There might be uh, data that is not reported either because it is not looked for or because it wasn't present. So this is statistically very challenging to see uh, what of uh, both options was actually the, the right one. Um, we don't have much follow-up data for most patients previously published. And also main issue is what was actually the date of diagnosis, what was the age when the patient was diagnosed. And so I've not done this literature review on my own. I had the help of Tim Van Dan, who is just uh, a great um, nephrologist actually, who is now in training as a clinical geneticist in our department. So he did uh, this literature first, and we will then continue with a study on novel identified adults with Myers syndrome. So looking at the literature data, and this doesn't include yet the Ghent patients, I uh, just showed only the one that was published. Um, so when we look at the literature data, we found that eight males were published, 17 females. Um, and at least eight individuals were actually only diagnosed in adulthood, and they all had this arginine uh, 496 cysteine. Um, as you can see, the majority of the patients has the codon change of the isoleucine 500. When we look at uh, stature uh, when they are adults, we see that they are both males and females uh, have a mean stature at P3, at least when we put them on the curves for, for the Belgian uh, population. But there is quite a huge range in, in final stature. We had a few reports that were uh, patients that had overweight with a BMI between 25 and 30, and two patients had frank obesity. Head circumference is normal to rather um, a big head circumference. When we look at the facial features, and this is important because it's quite difficult for these morphologists as, um, as we are um, to identify genetic disease in adulthood because we're used to look at children and we're less familiar with looking at adults. So sometimes phenotypes may change over the years. So that's still important to have this somewhat uh, defined. But at least in Myris syndrome, most of the features are still present in, in adulthood. So we found that most of the patients still have this rather prominent chin. They have rather a short upper lip and they may have short palpebral fissures. Some additional features we uh, think that might be identified is the earlier onset hair, lo hair loss, some low set ears, some downward turning of, of the mouth. Uh, and some patients also reported increased sweating. When we look at intelligence, we see that about one quarter was reported to have normal intelligence. Two thirds had normal intelligence, but some specific learning problems. Uh, one quarter had mild intellectual disability, meaning that they can live somehow independent with some support. And uh, about 10% had moderate uh, intellectual disability, requiring permanent help of others uh, to be able uh, to all to do the daily activities. Of course, we should be careful. This is only on data that we have of 11 patients. So what we see in the skeletal features is that we have often these short fingers, some narrowing of the fingers towards the ends. Joint limitations are often present, both of the small joints and the large joints. And we often see when we take radiographs that many of the bones are rather thick. 
this can be the skull, but also the ribs. Also, if you look at the articulations of the vertebra, uh, these can also be a little bit uh, enlarged as well as the necks of the, of the femoral bones. What of, of course very important is the acquired cardiovascular disease. So we see that about almost half of them uh, develop severe arterial hypertension, uh, progressive stenosis of both aortic valve and pulmonary valve were reported. And also we found that in several adults, there was a report of stenotic stretches of the artery or hypoplastic arteries that weren't identified previously. Finally, some may develop uh, a diseased heart muscle uh, that may cause uh, either heart failure or potential arrhythmias. And unfortunately, one individual was reported to have a fatal arrhythmia. Um, also, pericardial disease, so this is actually the, the pocket that is around the heart, may cause problems um, uh, and may become restrictive. Lungs, also very important. Airway stenosis is not unfrequent for patients who are reported to have airway stenosis. And this is absolutely a point of attention. So uh, on surgical procedures, it's really essential that in anesthesiologists with a very, um, that is very much experienced does the intubation. Obstructive sleep apnea syndrome uh, is also something that's reported in adults as probably an unreported feature. Uh, and progressive dyspnea also uh, was identified in two adults. The basis for that is not known. This could be restrictive lung disease, perhaps due to musculoskeletal features. This could be thickening of the airways, or maybe it could be also interstitial disease. Uh, so at uh, the lung uh, distal airway sacs where oxygenation occurs, there might also be some kind of proliferation of the connective tissue that may cause um, decreased oxygen uh, uptake. Hearing loss, something that's quite frequent in uh, Myris syndrome. So we have data on 26 patients. Uh, well, at least in one third of those, there was not reported if there was hearing loss. Uh, about uh, two thirds was reported to have hearing loss. Uh, this can be either conductive or sensory neural or mixed uh, type. Finally, um, the skin might be a little bit thickened. And when we look at the skin, uh, at the extracellular matrix of the skin, there are actually two very important structures. There is on one hand the elastin that gives some resilience. So when you pull your skin, it snaps uh, back easily. That is because of the elastin. And this can be compared to a, a trampoline. Uh, on the other hand, we have uh, collagen. These are like rope-like structures that give um, the strength to the skin. And so if we look into the skin in adults with Myris syndrome, we actually found that the elastic fibers that you see here is an elastic fiber in controls on the left hand side. You see that the elastin is quite uh, regular and at the borders you can see some microfibrils. These are um, like scaffolds on which the elastin is wrapped uh, around. While in Myris syndrome you see that this elastin is actually uh, disintegrated. On the other hand, if you look at the collagens, they seem rather normal. And here is just another uh, image to show that the collagen structure itself is relatively normal, but it seems to be more densely packed. So it was, well, on one hand, it could be surprising uh, that Myers syndrome is rather a problem of elastin, 
uh, than from college. And on the other hand, we do know that SMAP4 is very important also within the TGF beta signaling pathway, which is also uh, an important pathway for uh, elastic fiber homeostasis. So some premature conclusions on the literature that uh, was searched. We actually see that intellectual performance is quite good in uh, adults with Myers syndrome. Um, but uh, there is some need for some neuropsychological uh, follow-up for uh, functioning with regard to autism, uh, ADD, or anxiety. anxiety. Um, the cardiovascular risk is uh, important, but especially hypertension and the risk for stenosis, and also for cardiomyopathy, as Dr. Lindsay also uh, mentioned. Um, finally, there is also the pulmonary risk, and it's absolutely uh, important to have a good management of uh, the airway. Short stature and hearing loss is also known. And then very importantly, well, Myris syndrome is also regarded as a sporadic condition. We now have data that at least one female had uh, given birth to two uh, children, although it was post-fertilization procedures, uh, and one male that didn't report any fertility problems. So lifelong follow-up is absolutely indicated for every individual in Myris syndrome. Surgery, as already told before, only if absolutely necessary and avoid if possible. And if necessary, you really want to have a very experienced team. Finally, there is also a need for prospective work to see how adults are functionally, uh, functioning in, in daily life. Of course, I didn't do this work on my own. I also already mentioned Tim. Uh, Ilse Mirska also did some work on adults with Myra syndrome. And of course, I'd like to thank the advisory board and the Myra syndrome foundation and my sponsors. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Calwart. That was fantastic. Um, we do have a, a lot of questions for you here. Um, the first one is, do you know anything about the progressive nature of this disease in adults? Is this being studied? Uh, sorry, can you just repeat the question? <laughs> I had a, a... Oh, sure. Um, do you know anything about the progressive nature of this disease in adults? Is this being studied? Well, there are no specific studies on uh, the evolution in adults, so that's why we need these prospective studies. But what we know from the adults, what they report at child age, we know that the connective tissue manifestations, the proliferation, the fibrosis might become worse. That's something that, uh, that we know. And it's also very important to uh, keep that in mind for every surgical step or upon traumas or sports. You don't want to do perhaps any contact sports like fighting sports or, or whatever, but rather invest in sports uh, like cycling or swimming that uh, might be better. Okay. All right. The next question is what arrhythmias are associated with Myris? So they are not specific um, um, assessed at this point. It's, it's mainly re related to the cardiomyopathy. So I don't think the arrhythmias are the primordial event. It's rather if the heart muscle becomes diseased uh, that there is an increased risk for arrhythmias. Okay, all right. Um, do you work with anyone in the UK in building data or information? Uh, well, we have Sophia Dusgo, who is also in the advisory board, who has had a very long track record in, in the UK, and she is now, uh, I thought it was uh, in Denmark, um, but she still has her connections, and we hope to, to set up these collaborations to follow the adults with, with uh, Mary syndrome in the UK as well. 
Yeah. Okay, great. Um, let's see the next one. You had mentioned something about collagen and there's a question. Could someone take collagen to help with this? Well, I think there is the, the basic problem is that there is increased deposition of collagen. And so collagen is something that you cannot take. So if you would ingest it, it would just be broken down in, in the Eastern times. You cannot get it through an infusion. So uh, we just know that having a healthy diet is, is most important. So um, there's nothing specific you can do there. No. Okay. All right. Well, we really appreciate you answering all those questions and for your time. And we really appreciate you um, serving on the professional advisory board. Thank you very much. Thank My you. Pleasure. Thank you.